Hello, welcome. Welcome everyone. We're just waiting a few minutes for everyone to join just before starting this webinar. How are you today? Hello, hello, thanks. Thanks, morning, guys. And thanks, Samantha, and thank you, thanks, Ileana, too. Um, so yeah, let's get started with a little bit of intro. So first of all, um, I'm here today. So my name is Antonella, and I'm part of the admission team at Escape Studios. I specifically look after animation courses, storyboarding courses, and application. Um, so obviously then if you have also any question about the next intake, feel free to um, ask any question at the end uh, in the q and I will be happy also to help and answer. And I'm here today with Alex Williams, who is our head of uh, studies for the animation programs, and Rich, who was one of our escapee. So um, he did a short course with us and he will tell you more about his experience um and what he's doing at the moment so i'm not spoiler anything um and there will be so an interview between alex and rich uh and then we will lead together uh in the q a so obviously it's a great opportunity for you guys to ask any question uh to reach to alex or to myself too um so i will now pass it to alex hi alex good morning thank you antonella welcome how are you today I'm good? Good, I'm good yes how you doing? <laughs> good, good, good. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Escape Studios webinar. We're talking today to Rich Jeffrey, who is an amazingly talent, talented animator, animation director, and director, uh, and has recently won an Emmy for directing the second series of Bluey in Australia. Uh, he's also an escapee, which is to say he studied animation with us. In fact, Rich, I think you were one of our first students when we started doing um, running animation classes. Uh, I think some so, years ago. yeah. It was the, um, well, I did the six week one, wasn't it? Full time six week course. Gosh, that's right. It was only six weeks back then. So you did six yeah. weeks of 3D and then six weeks of, of animation. Uh, what are we doing? You know, you're right. It was 12 weeks. Yeah, it was 12, 12 weeks, wasn't that my mistake? But at one point we um, broke it up. So the, the 12 week course was six weeks of general visual effects and then six weeks of animation. And that was really short. That was like not a lot of animation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was intense, but it's good. That's a good way to learn. Yeah, that's right. And it was, yeah, it was mostly character animation focus, wasn't it, that we did in the end? Yeah, it was, and it was great. That was kind of, that was my first sort of foray into 3D. Yeah. I had um, I actually did a very very short course at Escape as well a few years prior to that, but it was just like a, a taster. It was like a yeah. couple of evenings, and you just learned very basic sort of interface of Maya and stuff. And that was um, that was enough to sort of get me started, thinking, "Oh, I want to yeah. I want to learn more of this." That's right. Yeah, because you'd done quite a bit. You'd done some two D animation before you came to us, so you really came to us. Lots of two D. Yeah, yeah. My whole career really has been two D. I started when I first started out. It was sort of many, you know, many years ago. Um, it was hand drawn. So in New Zealand, where I first got my start, did a couple of years of hand drawn animation. I moved to the UK when I was sort of twenty one, I think, and then um, and then was got into some advertising studios. I worked for Richard Curtins for a few years. Oh yeah, yeah, but all hand drawn, and then uh, yeah, and then eventually got a sort of a, a break into doing uh, series work, TV series work, oh. which sort of became my mainstay. Yeah. Um, whole time, I just in the in the back of my head, it was like I knew I sort of wanted to learn some three D and mm. diversify my sort of skill set a little bit, uh, and that's where Escape came in. Excellent. Yeah. So the, I think one of the reasons we, we wanted to talk to you, apart from just generally catching up with escapees and finding out what what everyone's doing, is because you 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 know you have um, managed to have a really interesting career doing both two D and 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 three D work. And now, of course, winning an Emmy, mm. that's that's pretty amazing for directing Bluey. So 
so and I think part of wanting to do this today is just to you know to help inspire our students um, sure. because of course there are there is work out there in the animation industry despite all the doom and gloom in the news and and, and animation is one of the areas that, that is still doing well so it's really great to talk to you and have some good news stories for for our um, yeah. and recent graduates why don't we why don't we start with Bluey tell us about how sure. Like directing a t an Emmy warning, I mean, I'm like, I'm jealous, right? I want, where's my Emmy? I don't have any Emmy. Uh, yeah, it's part, you know, I guess it's part um, having that experience in the industry, but there's also, I've, I've found through my career, you know, that opportunities come along just through sliding doors, you know, you, you never know what opportunities are created somehow. And this bluey came about for me because uh, a good friend of mine, Joe Brum, who's created the series, he directed season one and, and is the showrunner. He, um, we worked together in London. We worked together at Tiger Aspects on uh, a series yeah. called Charlie and Lola, which was my first break into series work. And so we both worked there as animators uh, and, uh, and I, then I switched to design for a little while. And the series sort of long story is that then when we came to the end of Charlie and Lola, he went back to Australia and started his own studio. And I got my first directing gig um, on a series called Tinga Tinga Tales, which we produced in Africa. So that divided us for a couple of years. I went to Africa for three years or whatever. And Joe went back to Australia and started his own little studio. And then... Where, where uh, in Africa? Sorry? Where in Africa? Uh, Kenya in Nairobi. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that, that was an amazing opportunity. Um, and then, so as he, over the years when he was running a studio, he had an idea for a series, which ended up being Bluey, and he made a little pilot and then sort of got that off the ground. And while he was getting that um, developed, he was emailing me saying, Rich, I really need you on this project that's going to kick off. You know, I'd love to have you over, come over and help me do it. And so that was kind of the start of the communication between us. And then as the project got more and more real, the, you know, it's um, got picked up at um, the Asian Animation Summit uh, and, you know, eventually got funded and was getting green lit. He said, uh, mate, I really need you to come over and help me start this because we were starting from scratch, you know, like really starting a studio from nothing. He employed about four people, four or five people. But Ludo Productions picked up Bluey and became the producers of it. So really, you know, we needed to start a studio of 50 people straight away. Um, so I went over. So that was sort of my call, really. I, I went over as the animation director for season one hmm. and helped, helped them start the studio. And it was kind of it just went on from there, really. It's just been a big roller coaster ride from there. But that was kind of my, my break into Bluey. I, because I had one directing role before, and Joe and I knew each other very well. Um, he uh, he just felt that I would be a good fit for, for getting um, help Bluey get it off the ground. And that was kind of my break, really. Because we often we often talk to well, we 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 sort of constantly talk to our students about networking and the <clears throat> kind of the power of soft connections in the industry. Um, and sometimes people think that networking means being you know being nice to people at cocktail parties, although not anymore, obviously, because there are no more of those. <laughs> But it sounds like it's more just a sort of informal connection to other people in the industry and then yeah, them feeling like they can work together with you on a, on a, on a project. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of that. You know, there is obviously sometimes you just have to cold call and apply for jobs at studios. Yeah. But, um, you know, throughout your career, if you build connections, then slowly those things start to work for you in a, you know, in a very good way and and um because we knew each other you know it was it's um it was a very sort of natural step mm. like i've i have in some jobs i've applied for and some i just um i never applied for it just got through word of mouth and people got in touch or i knew a project was going on and so there is a lot of that so networking within in, in within the industry and keeping friends and keeping those connections is very important because you you never know what's around the corner yeah um, just so everyone listening knows, we <clears throat> what we'll do is we're going to talk for about um, half an hour, 35 minutes, something like that. Uh, just sort of talk to, to Rich about his work and his career, and then we'll take questions afterwards. So if anyone's got questions, just pop them in the chat and then we'll we'll get to them. You can pop them in at any time um, and then we'll we'll pick up questions um, uh, uh, later on. 
So, um, so I mean, winning the Emmy, was that like a big surprise? Did you guys know you had an award-winning project or? <laughs> well, that's a very good question because, you know, even with any, with any show, you know, with any series work or almost anything you produce, you never really, especially series work anyway, you really, you never really know how it's going to be received. You no. know, it could, it could be do really well or it could flop. And we sort of halfway through season one, uh, before it got released, we, yeah, we sort of felt like we were making a, a good thing. You know, we, of course it was, we never take anything for granted, but touch wood, but we were looking at the episodes and we just felt that, um, you know, and the crew were just loving it. You know, they were really into it. So we sort of felt like we had a good thing and we, we were hoping we would have. And then when it got released in Australia and kind of just took off, you know, we were, beyond it was way beyond what we expected you know so it was actually very it was a very pleasant very wonderful thing for it to sort of get received so well and who finally so was it was it the abc the australian broadcasting exactly a abc and bbc worldwide okay. uh, and there's also um funding elements in australia so this uh, screen queensland and screen australia yeah who also uh, contribute um, but it really, so it really just took off. And so the, and then when we found out we were nominated for an Emmy, of course, it was, that was all very exciting. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it didn't get to go because it was all locked down. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, man. But when it's, it, it was surprising when it came, you know, we never, I don't think anyone in the studio uh, really puts in too much expectation, you know, in terms of, oh, it's, we weren't saying to ourselves, oh, we're going to win this, you know, it was never that. It was almost, yeah. there was definitely excitement for being in. Yeah. And then when we won, it was it was really quite a magic thing, really. Um, so very unexpected in, in a sense. Yes. And as director, you're obviously, so you you started off as animation director on series one, and that's obviously running the animation, right? What, what, what's, yep. what's your job on, on, on that? How, how, what does your day look like as animation director? Pretty full on. We have, um, well, in the first season anyway, like we made a few changes for season two. In the first season, we had uh, four teams of uh, animators, four teams of uh, five. And we started with four teams of four and we had three weeks to produce. One team had three weeks to produce an episode. So the, the way we do it is each team takes episode each and they're um, rolling or staggered in their timing. So one week an episode is starting the next week another is starting and so forth um so at any one week there's an episode in a, at a certain stage in production um so we have four teams of animators we have 20 animators and my job as animation director um well we had three teams sorry for season one was to really just run that team so all the design work everything before that stage is done you know so it's it's been storyboarded there's an animatic it's all the designers and the riggers have done their work and it's by the time it comes to the animators, they have everything they need. All the all the voice takes, um, they have the animatic to follow from, they have the scenes laid out, everything. So really my job was to manage those teams. Mm. Um, so we would have, and each one of those teams has a lead. So the lead animator would help the animators and do little duties like decide how they're going to split the episode up, what animators are going to be doing, what scenes and all this kind of stuff. And they would do the first round of checks with the animators too. So the, the animator, when they had something to show, would go to their lead and their lead would have a look and critique and go, yeah, okay, I think that's ready to show to Rich. So then yeah. I would come along and I would look at their work and critique and make changes um, or not make changes. Yeah. And really just, and just keep the overall vision of each one of those episodes, you know, what's the story in the episode? Where, where are the, what are the performance scenes and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Where do the animators put in the effort? Um, where can they save time, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we we quickly found that three weeks, we kind of did underestimate that a little bit. Um, and it was very, very tough. On, so season two, we expanded that. We went to four weeks and mm. we brought in extra animators and stuff like that to, to ease that. So yeah, as the animation director, I'm, I'm involved really just with the animation and not the other, mm. other departments around that, um, like sound and music and... And then season two, when I stepped into directing, then that those roles all that um, expanded, you know, in terms of the department. Yeah. So we'll Just before we get into directing, so you said that you used riggers on Bluey. So what software were you using for the animation? Yeah, so we show? use um, a piece of software called Cell Action, which is actually oh, made okay. in the UK. Yeah, yeah made yeah. by Andy yeah. 
uh, best out. And That's um true. and Simon, yeah. And and Cell Action is a really good great piece of software for 2D. So it's 2D digital. Um so it works a little bit like 3D. It's vastly yeah. different, of course. But the animators aren't drawing, you know, they have digital puppets that they're um right. they're animating with. Yeah. So to create these puppets, we need a team of um, riggers and, well, we call them designers, but they will rig mm -hmm. those characters. They'll also do all the props and the backgrounds. Yeah. And um, we also have an art direction team. So the art directors will create the, uh, just with still images, they'll create the visual look of each episode. Yeah. And then that goes to the designers and the background artists, sort of like background artists. Yeah. And that comes together sort of for the animation. So yeah, it's a 2D, 2D digital software. Yeah, yeah, in interesting. And because I think often um, our SKPs, because we train obviously primarily in Maya, uh, mm. and they think, you know, if they'll see a job in, in Cell Action or Toon Boom Harmony or something like that, and they'll think, oh, well, I, I shouldn't apply for that because I don't know that software. But I always encourage people to yeah. apply anyway, because if you've got a great 3D reel, it's not going to take you that long to learn the software. No, that's right. That's one hundred percent. And if if you have a really strong three um, D reel, like you, if your sh reel shows um, strong examples of the principles of animation, you know, then that skill is transferable, and you can learn a program like so. You can learn to animate in selection relatively quickly. It's nowhere near as complex as Maya. Right. And right. for example, um, for example, for season three. We've have advertised again for a couple of animators, a few animators, just to expand the team. Yeah, and we even opened that up to three D animators and well, always traditional animators, but three D animators as well, just for that reason, because um, you know uh, you might find come across a really good three D animator, and it's like, well, actually, we can train that person, which is what yeah. we're doing. We're offering training for for the people who don't know selection but are good animators. Right. Um, so certainly there's opportunities out there like that. That's literally what we're doing now is yeah. we, um, we're opening up to 3D people. Interesting. Okay. And are you looking for remote hires or is it strictly um, Australian? No, music? mostly mo really in-house. Um, through COVID, uh, we can get into that, but we did go remote. Yeah. But for, for full-on production, it's really it's better for a studio or better for us anyway, to have everyone in house. Yes. There's a couple of, you know, there are a couple of remote sort of things that we do with a few people, but generally, yeah, as, as a whole production, it's much easier to have everyone in house, yeah. to be honest. And yeah. I presume when you, when you got started, you didn't have, when you were doing series one, you didn't have 30 animators in Australia who knew cell action. I imagine. Oh, no, not at all. Wow. That, you know, that was one of our biggest hurdles is okay. How, how do we crew up? And um, so we ran a big training program uh, yeah. where we, and that was for mostly for our animators and our, and our designers, the guys who would be rigging. So we had a four weeks, was it six weeks? I think we did four weeks of training for the animators and two weeks for the designers. Mm. And so we did bring a couple of people out from the UK that knew Selection, or well, myself from New Zealand, but I knew Selection very well. Yeah. Uh, and we, brung a designer out from the uk and we did have one or two uk animators who was selection experience just so that we had a a core yeah. um staff of people who had experience with selection and then we trained up everyone else and most of those people that came were graduates from the university universities in brisbane and, okay. and some around the country and some in Sydney. but yeah we had to train everybody it was really really full on we had four weeks of training and then we had production <laughs> so a lot of the animators for them, it was, it was their first job out of uni. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they were really thrown in the deep end. A little bit. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. Um, and okay, so so then so so then on series two, you were the director, and that's obviously a much bigger role. Um, yeah, involved. bigger and uh, yeah, great opportunity again. It was it was so that was my now second directing role, hmm. and um, and that came about really because Joe. So everything had been going really well in season in season one, and we just needed to expand. And Joe felt he wanted more time so he could write scripts, mm. you know, because he was so overwhelmed in season one, or we kind of all were. Mm. Um, so he wanted to step back and let me direct, which was great. I just, mm. I just jumped at that opportunity. Uh, yeah. And then our two of our leads stepped up 
to fill into the animation director role. Right. Because we we were expanded the team, we decided actually two animation directors was um, a good way to go. Yeah. And then myself directing, and then Joe still as the showrunner, so still his you know still his show. He has yeah. ultimately the creative decision on everything. Yeah. But just by by him stepping back and letting me direct, it just freed up his time to really just concentrate on scripts. Uh, although he still is involved with music and uh, and some of the other processes, yeah. and then for me to cut, go in there and just take on all those other roles that he didn't have time for. Hmm. So yeah, all of a sudden it was a big step up, and I was looking after all the departments now. So I'd be involved in the storyboards, um, the, the art director teams, the designers, the layout, the animation, the music. Now also moved into music and sound, hmm. and then voice records. I did all the voice records as well. So, so yeah, you, it was quite important. Yeah, you directing the voice talent too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, and so yeah, and so some new roles there for me, which was great, you know. And and so I jumped at those. The voice records yeah. are a lot of fun. I really enjoy yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. And the sound, sound and music is just fantastic. Yeah. So sound and music are the two things we do out of house. So we'll go over to the composer studio. We do that once a week. We'll have like a three-hour music session to see where it's all at. And it, those sessions are just fantastic. They're so much fun. Mm. It's so different from the rest of the week, you know. Yeah, 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 I bet. And then the okay. same thing with the sound. The sound's a lot of fun too, you know. And th Amazingly, on season two, the sound studio was right next to my house. So every Friday when we did the final mix, I would just walk out of my house, get a coffee, and then go to the sound studio and, <laughs> and do a, a two-hour sound session, you know, on a Friday morning. And that was bliss. That was fantastic. Brilliant. And where in Australia is it made? In Sydney? No. No, in uh, Brizzy, Brisbane. Brisbane. Okay, got it, got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and, it, was a new, it was a new move, like it was a move over to Aussie, and, but it was just, yeah, it was one of the best things I've done, actually. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you're actually, just so everyone knows, you're actually in New Zealand now, because you, you guys are resting. Uh, Correct, yeah. Yeah. Doing... yeah, that's right. So we just finished season two, Yeah. and uh, we're kind of gearing up for season three, but it's in this very, it's really nice, because, you, you know, with any production, people who are listening haven't have never been in one you know there's this nice little wind-up period mm -hmm. in pre-production before the animators and designers start there's just you're planning the season yeah there's only core staff there it's very nice and gentle but it slowly ramps up ramps yeah. up ramps up as all the different teams start and then there's about a year where everything is going on it's just mayhem you know it's just full-on production for a year and then it starts to tail off as all those departments finish so you know the the storyboard artists are the first to go and then the and then the art directors and it tails off and as you get into that tail off period then it becomes really nice again you know you just start to settle down and things begin become a little bit more normal yeah and and we're in that period now where we've finished season two and it's all trailed off and we're just just slowly winding up for season three so in about uh in january our first art directors will start yeah yeah, um, and then it will just wind up from there. Yeah, and then so in about six months, I'll be I'll be like, oh. <laughs> I'll be a very different person. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, certainly on any production I've ever worked on, at the end, there's there's never enough time and there's never enough money. And it doesn't matter how big. Oh, it is. and it doesn't stop. You know, like that. It just that train keeps on going, and it's every week is for us. Every week is a delivery. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, so and and speaking of which, um, one of the questions we often get asked at Escape Studios is how, how how many seconds does an animator have to do? And obviously that's very different on a Disney show for a TV series, but for what you guys are doing, what what, what would an animator be expected to produce every every week? Well, we we on season one we based it on um, what we had done uh, in Charlie and Lola, mm. and then it was it was the animators would had to do. Uh, 30 seconds a week. So I think mm. it's 750 frames. Mm. Um, so yeah. roughly 150 a day round about. Yeah. So it is very much, you've got to, you know, obviously yeah. we're counting frames. A lot of productions, mm. you're just keeping tabs on where people are because you have to meet these little milestones. Mm -hmm. um, but we quickly found for the animation, the quality of animation that we were pushing for in Bluey and what we wanted to achieve, we, we pretty quickly found in season one that that wasn't enough. Um, or, or it was too much, sorry, it's I should say. Okay. Mm. It was too much, yeah. Exactly. So we we had to bring in extra animators to get to help the teams out and have floating animators. And, and so we actually lowered that 
quota. So 750, mm. I think now our animators are, uh, are doing about 500 to 550 frames a week. Okay. Which is actually pretty low. That's the lowest for any TV series I've worked on. Mm. Um, but I, I would say that we're probably pushing the animation bar further than mm. uh, probably what we've done in the past. So, yeah, and, and you know, right. but because it's a family of four, quite often you've got four characters on screen, you know, sometimes yeah. six more. And, and the more characters on screen really directly equates to more work, you know, because you've got just got that many more characters to animate. So, yeah, we're, we're roughly doing, I think it's about 550 a week. So that's a drop of 200 frames a week. That's about 23 seconds, according to my trusty calculator. Yeah, yeah, it'd be about that, <laughs> yeah. So the, our te the, basically the teams have four weeks to produce um, an episode of seven minutes. But yeah. if you take off the credits and the title and the credits, the, the episodes are actually six minutes and 20 seconds. Okay. So they've got yeah. so a team of five have four weeks to do yeah. that amount of animation. That's quite fun for the animators, though, because you get a lot of, I mean, presumably you get a chunk of the show that you're responsible for and you can kind of yeah, take ownership. Totally. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, you know, we really, our thing is we really want the animators to flourish. You know, we don't try and control. We definitely have a style that we want to adhere to and stuff. But we also yeah. want to give a lot of freedom to our animators, you know, so they feel free to put their own flair and and, and have fun with it, you know. Otherwise... You don't want to you don't want to sort of take that energy away from the animators you know you want you want to give them freedom but still within keeping within what is our style really yeah and presumably it's all about getting some strong poses and kind of staying in those poses um strong poses and... strong timing but just also character performance you know and really reading the emotion of what you know is being delivered in that line or what is the key you know sometimes there's in the script or within the episode there's key jokes we need to hit you know we just got to make sure that the, the timing of those is hit right and that it's very clear and readable and the same thing with the emotional tones you know the acting there's a lot a lot we've put a lot of time into sort of getting the performance of the animation correct not just the kind of mechanics of it um yes but so that you know and that inevitably takes up takes more time which is why you know really yes. we sort of had to bring the quota down of how what the animators are expected to do yes um, and so yeah, we're, we're constantly trying to find a nice balance, you know, between yeah, our biggest struggle on Bluey really, the, which is and the goalposts are always shifting for us, is is really making sure finding that balance where we're not working the animators to the bone, where people aren't stuck there every night doing late nights, they can go mm -hmm. home on time, but yet they you know produce it to a quality that is uh, that they can be very proud of, you know, and and put their, their creative energy into. So yeah, that that's been a, a big tricky balance for us, just getting that right. Yes, yes. Um, and as director, are you are you involved in the writing of the show, or is it more the execution of it? No, more the execution of it. So Joe really writes yeah. all of them. Although I am lined up to write one because I've been I've had, oh, cool. had a script that I want to write for season three. So hopefully I'll get that off the ground. Nice. And um, but no, of of the hundred and four episodes we've made, I think he's written probably. Uh, 99 of them. Wow, 104. Yeah, which is amazing. It's amazing. Like, how he does it, I really don't know. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> it's a lot of scripts. But it's six minutes, six minutes script. Yeah. Yeah, six minutes, 20 scripts. You know, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of writing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Wow, amazing. So, yeah, so um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully I'll get my script off the ground. <laughs> There's actually a question here on writing from Celeste, um, yes. which is, is probably a good time to take that. Um, how do the ideas for this series come up as a team? You're used to do brainstorming session or you work on a fully formed story. So I guess you've well, kind of already a, answered that's that. That's a really good question. I think, you know, Joe just had it in his head. He just had this idea in his head for a long time and he knew what he wanted to make out of the show. I think from having done lots of principal shows in the past, he knew what he wanted to sort of try and create. But really for him, it's, he's writing about the kind of his family life. You know, he has a very similar situation that he has two kids who are the pre, at preschool age. And he mm -hmm. just really wanted to make something that represented modern parenting and really showed parents uh, in, in a more relatable uh, light. You know, I think quite often 
especially the dads get portrayed as being kind of like, you know, gormless buffoons and stuff like that. Whereas yeah. he didn't feel that was a fair, you know, really, a really real representation of modern parenting. Right. But the other thing that he was really fascinated about was, um, you know, how kids learn at that preschool age, the development mm -hmm. and the things they go through learning at that age. And what he found from a lot of his research was that a lot of their learning comes through play at that age of preschool. Mm -hmm. And, and just the development, the learning they take on by playing games and playing roles and all that kind of stuff. And that's really what fascinated them. So a lot of the ideas for the scripts of the episode or, um, are based around actually play and then interaction with their parents and how their parents and the kids play together, you know. So it really had, I think that was his inspiration really. He just wanted to um, make sure that it represented modern family life and dealt mm. with how kids learnt at that sort of preschool age. Yes, uh, it's interesting because we, well, about a month ago, we did a very similar webinar, which for those of you who haven't seen it, with Evgenia Golubeva is really, really interesting. Uh, and you should definitely watch that because Evgenia, like Rich, is uh, directing her own series uh, or directing her own films, but she's going down the short film route um, in festivals and also writing for Disney. But like you, she's she's writing about her daughter because she's got a she's oh, got a yeah. kid, which she's also a mum. So uh, I think a lot of her experiences, a lot of her writing, is coming from her experience raising her daughter. Hundred percent, yeah. And write about what you know. Writing, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then of course it's authentic, uh, and it has it's authentic, truth and, and also all that material is there for, in front of you, you know, like, and you can't. You know, you could really only capture that for Joe, you know, like he, he just writes things and picks up things where you could only get that if you had two kids, you know, at, at that age, because it's, all, it's just all there in front of you. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Yes, so that, that was kind of um, the, the essence of it. Yes. So, um, so for those of you, anyone else out there who wants to uh, fire off questions, um, uh, do type your questions in the, in the chat and we'll, We'll, um, we'll pick those up. Um, what about um, the sort of general state of the animation industry? What are you, what are you finding? Obviously COVID has forced you guys to, to work remotely, but it hasn't stopped you making series three. No, it hasn't. And, you know, I can really only, I guess, speak from my own experience about the, what I'm seeing in the industry, but for, in Australia, at least, the, the feeling is that it's, it's doing really well, animation, you see, because you could relate it you know you could put it into the film industry tv and all that kind of stuff and if you look at the live action sector of the film industry you know that really got shut down you know yes. a lot of productions had the halt nothing no live action could get made at all and in that time you know animation just kept going you know it was productions didn't have to stop they could send people home remotely so there's kind of been this little flourish really where um in australia you know animation is actually doing quite well at the moment and there's more animation getting made now because live, live action couldn't. So a lot more advertising and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and there's been a, there's a, it feels like there's been a little bit of a boom in Australia in the last year, despite COVID. Yeah. Um, and we sent everyone home, and whew, that was that was a big effort, but it was doable. So you know, luckily for us, you know, and I, I certainly don't take it for granted, but luckily for us, you know, we could continue. No one lost their jobs. Everyone just had to yeah. work from home for a while. Um, it, it was tricky. It was a lot to coordinate, but we, we finished. We, we still delivered Bluey through COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a really promising sign for animation studios is that yes. it's kind of can continue, which is great. Yes. And when you, because you, you said that on series two, you were able to put a little more, um, more resources into the animation. Have you found that your budgets are increasing over time as the show's success is proven, or are you still having to do the same? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, much to the dismay of the broadcasters, I'm sure. But we did, we did up a little bit for season two. Yeah, only because okay, yeah. really we just had to. We just, you know, it, mm. it wasn't fair to push the team through another season like season one. Right. Um, yeah. We really needed those extra animators, and it wasn't just the animators. I think we. Um, boosted the background team a little bit uh and yeah a few other departments but you yeah, mostly the animators but um yeah so it was you know i think there's a kind of a a general expectation that if like a studio starts up 
when you make a season of something, then you know the, the next season should either cost about the same or be a little bit less because the studio is still set up. But re in reality, you know, all our computers are leased, so we've got a whole new lease of computers in. There's we move to a new building, we need more staff and all that kind of stuff. So really, um, it, it doesn't for us. It didn't get cheaper anyway. Um, there's a question here in the Q and A from Mona who says, budget-wise, weren't you considering subcontracting to other cheaper countries? That's a really good question. Um, um, yeah, it's a good question, yeah. but but ultimately, no, because, you know, we wanted it to be a homegrown thing, you know, Bluey to be homemade. And and actually with, you know, the great advantage or, or the, you know, the, the result that's come from, say, like a program like Cell Action, you know, because before the digital... Um, 2D digital thing where things are getting hand drawn. You know, animation is quite expensive, or even more expensive than it is now. Mm. Whereas the 2D digital thing has all of a sudden made series work a little bit more economical, and you can produce it, and therefore you can keep it in the country. You know, you don't have to farm it out. So mm. you know, it's actually really good because now you can have homegrown content, and you've got studios in Australia being able to produce it, and you can hire local um, talents and it becomes a home made thing so in essence no because one of the big pitfalls i've, I've haven't have had very little first-hand experience with it but certainly from what i hear a lot is you know you send stuff overseas you're opening up so many problems because yeah. there's no quality there's no control over the quality of what comes back um you quite often have to send people over there to manage it um it becomes very difficult really to be honest mm. So, well, no, it certainly was not something that was ever on the radar for us. Yes, I mean, certainly in London, Blue Zoo have done the same. Uh, they've brought mm. the animation back to the UK. Uh, Which is great, right? It's, it's fantastic, great. yeah, because it, it meant it created sort of 200 jobs in London and those, those jobs hadn't been there before. And, and exactly. so it's been really a huge pleasure for us to see those animation jobs come back to the UK and to be valued. Um, and yeah. yeah. And for the actual process of animation to be valued as a as a creative part of the production, and not just like making shoes, <laughs> or something, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah. The widgets and some, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, so that's good. That's great. That you, yeah, that's really good that you guys are doing that. So you're able to nurture in-house talent, and presumably your communication with your animators is so much better if you're if they're all there. So much better. Yeah, so much better. And um, and you know, there was you know in the in that first season it was a lot of work it was a lot of work to get the animators up to scratch, you know because they were really you know this was their first job out of uni for most of them yeah um, and they've now been with us through two seasons and they're fantastic animators but there was a lot of work to get them there in the first place um, and that's really just purely because there wasn't the pool of cell action animators that you'd have in the UK you know this cell action's been in the UK for years and years. Yeah. And uh, lots of studios are using it, whereas in Australia, yeah. we're the only ones. And so we, yeah. had, we had no one with selection experience. What, what are other studios using Down Under? Uh, I, I guess the um, biggest competitor would be Toon Boom. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the, those we have, two are out here as well. Yeah. Toon Boom Harmony. Yeah. Toon Boom, yeah, Harmony. We have um, our VFX artists who, who do hand drawn elements for us, like water and all this kind of fluids and, and um, if, everything that needs visual effects. They use uh, Animate, which I think used to be Flash. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They use Animate for the hand drawn stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'll take Toon Boom. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> we've got a we've got a question here from Samantha who says, uh, "Do you have any suggestions for an entry level animator that is in the process to seek for a work position?" Good question. Yeah, look, very good question because you know obviously there's there's um, a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of students looking for work each year. Um, I would reiterate probably actually a really good piece of advice you gave me, um, Alex, was that you know you can you tailor your showreel a little bit for the job. Mm. If, if it's an animation job you're going for, then show you, your animation work. Um, you know, present your work, put your strongest stuff up front when you do a showreel. Yeah. You know, you really want to hit straight away with strong work. 
and, and finish with strong work as well if you can. And don't put too much in. The, the biggest thing you want to do when you represent yourself online is you want to make your work easily accessible. So don't have a really complicated website. Um, have all the information about you easy, you know, your resume, your CV, your cover letter, have that there and have links to your work um, very easy to follow, you know, because mm. from a studio's perspective, and we're going through this now, you know, because we've advertised for animators, we're mm. getting inundated with applications. Okay. Right. You know, and we don't have time to watch a five minute show reel. Right. No one has time to watch a five minute show reel. So don't send the five minute show reel, you know, send, especially if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're just coming out from being a student, you won't have a lot of work, you know, you won't have a lot of experience. So don't try and fill a three minute show reel. You're right. much better having better off having a one minute, 30 second, whatever, one minute, one minute, 30, just strong show reel of your strongest work. Because, you know, sometimes we've got 50 applicants to look through in a day, you know, okay. you want, you, you watch that show reel and it's really the first 20 or 30 seconds that are going to grab your attention and you'll, and you'll continue to watch. Yes. Um, okay. So that, in terms of representing yourself online, that that would be my my biggest piece of advice. Just really sh short show reel with your best work. Make it easy to access. Whether it's a link to your website or just a link to Vimeo, that's fine. Um, and just be very concise. And yeah, that would be my that would be my biggest advice. And then in terms of like getting out there, you've just got to apply. You know, if this is your first job you're applying for. You know, look at everything and consider moving. You know, if, mm -hmm. if the job isn't there for you in the city you're living in, you know, well, if you're young and you've got no ties, you might find an opportunity in another city, you know, so be willing to move, um, I would say. It is quite a sort of a competitive world out there now of animation. Mm -hmm. um, and then what else? I think, you and then really just, just, you just while you're moving. studying. Sorry? Sorry, sorry, go. I, I interrupted you. Uh Keep, no, no, that's yeah. right, that's right. Oh, and the other thing too is maybe don't expect your first job to be, you know, your your um, dream job, you know. Right. It's 99.9% of the time it's not going to be, you know, gonna, you're just going to have to get that job to get in and then move from there, you know. So if, you're, if you've made your own film and you want to be a director, you know, your first job, you might not be a director, you know. You might be an animator or a designer or something, you know. But don't discount that opportunity because... You take your first job, I guarantee you it's going to open up other opportunities, you know. So it's like a first time home buyer, you know. We all want that amazing house for our first house when you buy a house. <laughs> and then you enter the market and you get this really rude shock. It's like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So it's a little bit like that with your first job, you know. I think when you get into the market, you'll find out what's out there, what jobs are available. And if an opportunity comes along, you know, and it's but it's not your your dream job or your what you envisioned, Mm. I wouldn't necessarily discount that opportunity, you know. No, and you moved, you moved to the UK, didn't you, when you were 21? Yeah, I did. yeah, 21, I moved from New Zealand to the UK. Mm. And um, and oh, that just exploded for me. I mean, you know, that really just opened up. Um, mm. It was amazing. And, you know, to be fair, it was back in the day, we're talking 90, this is 95. Mm. So kind of pre-digital era a little bit. Um, yes. And, you know, the studios had time to say hello to you, you know, and you bring them up and they'd be like, oh, come on in, why don't you meet us? You know, that's changed a little bit now. Yeah. It's a little less casual only because the industry has grown so much. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I moved to London and then I was just willing to do anything, you know. Um, when that directing job came along for uh, Tinga Tinga Tales when I moved to Africa, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just saw that as like yeah i'll move to africa for three years it's mm. crazy why not you know give it a go um so, so i'd be i'd say yeah, don't be afraid to do that how did that come about i didn't even know there were animation studios in nairobi i mean of course well, I'm there wasn't no no there wasn't we, we built it we started wow. it up okay. um, a little bit like we did with bluey we just started the, the studio from nothing so we very similar thing we went over there we found the best of the local talent that we could and mm. then we trained them up Mm. We did six weeks of training and made a pilot mm. and then got the pilot off the ground, came back to the UK, got the pilot off the ground, then we went back again and then very similar thing, built a whole studio, you know, um, trained up our animators, our designers, our art directors. And within about six weeks, we hit production. And uh, that was crazy. 
Is that studio still up and running? No, no, no. It's sort of um, finished with us when we finished Tinga. There were, but we did, our idea was to leave a studio, working studio there to, to mm. continue. Mm. Um, but um, some of the guys are still there, but not in that studio. So they're still animating away and making films, which is great. So we, we kind of started a little thing there, which is nice. Yes, interesting. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> what about how, what about studying at Escape Studios? What what advice would you give to students to you know getting the most out of their studies at a, at Escape? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. And the, the one thing I I found um, because I actually did a, a little extra bit of study when I came back to New Zealand as well. I did some more three D study, and mm -hmm. um, and look, the one thing I've found, is particularly as an adult, at least, you know, when I studied. Uh, even at Escape 10 years ago, you know, I was in my 30s. Mm. So I, I was a much better student as an adult than I ever mm. was, you know, at school. So <laughs> look, my piece of advice, really, if you, if as a student entering is, it's on you, it's on you to make the most out of it as a student, you know, be an adult mm. and, and really commit to it. And, and think of it as a job, you know, get there early, be focused, listen to the lessons, practice what you've got to practice, do your homework and just give it everything you've got because it's your, for a start, it's your education, you're paying yeah. for it and you're only going to get one shot, you know, you're only going to get one shot to really, and I think that all the way through, you're only going to get one shot at everything, you know, you're only as good as your last job. So if you want to learn animation, really sink into it and um, you get all the resources you can, just, just be the best student you can, you know, and really take that onus on yourself, that responsibility to turn up to class. Don't take days off, all that kind of stuff. Because yeah. what you put in is what you're going to get out of it, you know. And yeah. and I found that when I when I went back to study in New Zealand as well, I had, you know, I paid quite a lot of money for this course and I knew that I really wanted to excel in it because it was going to mm. open up opportunities for me to continue working in New Zealand. And plus mm. I just wanted to get really good at 3D. Yeah. So I just gave it everything. And, you know, I was seeing students that didn't turn up. They were, whether they were local students or foreign students, you know, I just don't quite, I didn't feel a lot of them had the maturity to really yeah. take it on themselves to do self-directed learning, you know, because that's, yes. when you get to university or, you know, escape studios, you know, you really, as students, you're becoming adults, you know, so you've got to yeah. take that responsibility on yourself, I think, to, to do really well that would be my advice mm. because when you when you go out there you're looking for jobs it's competitive mm. so you've got yes, to be a competitive that, that, yeah yes yes no i think that is a challenge for many students especially in the beginning in the first year on our undergraduate courses they come from school where it's very top-down delivery and suddenly yeah. it's much more of a bottom-up approach that's right yeah and it can you know, be harder, with, harder. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, that would really just be my advice is, you know, really, it's your time. It's your time to learn, you know, make the most of it, make the most of, you know, what's there. Mm. And, you know, for me, it was no. the same when I, you know, when I did that 12 week course at Escape, you know, everything was there. Everything I needed was, was there. I had you tutoring. We had all the machines. I had access to the machines. Um, so there was no reason for me not to, give it the best I could you know and I think that's where as students you've got to take that on a little bit it's like you know yeah yeah, yeah. I, I can so actually remember like, really well because <clears throat> you um I remember you were struggling with the Maya interface um oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember you were, you were having real trouble with the graph editor and then there was a sort of there was a point at which it just suddenly clicked and I came over to your desk and I suddenly saw you'd done this beautiful piece of animation. And it was like it had all come, the Maya stuff, it had all just come into focus for you. It I did, it really, it all did click. Very 100%. Quickly. Oh, the graph editor. <laughs> the first time yeah. I saw the graph editor, I was like, oh my God, what's going on? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then it just clicked. Yeah, then it, that's right. And, th and I think, you know, that probably just came from perseverance, me just sitting there going, right, I've got to get this, I'm learning this, I'm learning it. And then it, and then it just yeah. clicks. And what it does is great. Yeah, and I because I could think anyone anyway, you did a really nice reel when you 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 graduated from Escape, um, and um, you know I'm sure somebody looking at it would just think, okay, you know, here's someone who really, really mastered Maya 
made made it look easy, but actually it wasn't easy. I remember you you really had to fight for that. Um, totally. And yeah, then yeah, when you got absolutely. it, it, it just absolutely flowed from your fingertips. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a period at the beginning where it was. Oh, I looked at the interface of my and I was just like, I had so many questions. <laughs> and um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, once once you get it, it's it's great, you know. But it did. Yeah. That came from that perseverance, I think. Um, is that just don't give up, you know? If you if you're not getting it, you know, it'll come, and, and just keep at it. Yes. And so when when you say that you're you know you're you're sending out a, a job alert and you're getting fifty applicants, um, that's a lot of people applying for jobs. But I presume yeah. that you know probably most of those applicants are not, you know, at the level you're looking for. Um, well, we yeah, like it's it's a really interesting question because yeah, obviously um, studios most studios are open, you know. To giving opportunities to people starting out in the industry and we certainly were you know season one of mm -hmm. louis it was like all our animators were graduates but one or two like leads mm. and and that's something we really wanted to do you know because we were correct all of a sudden we created 50 jobs for yeah um, students which is if you're in a position to do that it's fantastic yes um but you know also what we're finding now you know, but there was a lot of work to be fair, you know, that was to bring 50 graduates up to a production standard. There's, mm. there's a lot, a lot of work. And so you don't really want to have to go through that every season. Do you know what I mean? So when we went into season two, we really, we really wanted to retain our staff. We didn't want to have to get another whole bunch of animators to train up because yes. it's, just, it's exhausting, quite, yes. you know, to be honest. So, you know, season two, when we needed new animators, we, our preference was to find people with a little bit of experience, you know, one or two years, unless their student showreel was particularly strong. Yeah. Because we were still offering training, you know, we still offered four weeks of animation training. Um, season three, um, we have, we still have all our animators from season one plus the extras, but we need a few more. And, and at, at this time around, just for our own preference, we want experienced people um, and mm. because we don't want to go through this the long um, training, training period yeah. of getting yeah. people up to speed so yeah so that has changed a little bit for us over the seasons you know season one we just we opened it up to everyone yeah and we, we're still opening it up to everyone but we're just trying to find that balance now of like still opening up opportunities for graduates but yeah. also having the advantage of um, industry experience yes Understood. Um, there's a question here from Ileana who says, what advice would you give the storyboard artists from your position? So I guess you, you do employ storyboard artists on the show. Is that right? Yeah, we do. We do actually. Um, that's a, that's a really good question with the storyboards. You want to work all the people that apply for us, you know, we were really looking at, um, obviously examples of the storyboards. Mm. And the things that jump out for us, you know, when we're looking at a storyboard, it's not just as can they draw, mm. you know, it's the language of the storyboard, you know, does it flow? Can I tell what's going on just by looking at the pictures and reading a little bit of text, you know? Mm. Um, so you really want to show uh, work in your, in your, either your sh showreel or your website or whatever of nice, clear presentations of storyboards. Again, very easy to read and make sure they flow well, you know, because we, we will be looking for, okay, not only is it drawn well, but have they staged that scene correctly, you know, is the camera correct, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in terms of applying, you know, we've had all we've had all levels of people apply for storyboard artists, you know, so we've had some very obviously experienced ones that jump mm. out to us. Mm. But we've also pe had people who um, are applying who aren't experienced. But they're very keen, you know. They're happy yeah, to do a yeah. test, you know. Yeah. So if a studio asks you to just do a storyboard test, you know, I would do it, and because yeah. they, it's an opportunity for you to mm. show what you can do, and for them to understand, you know, how you can work from a brief. Mm. Um, and you know, and then and then a little bit of like the squeaky wheel thing, you know, like we'll have people that will email us again. Hey, remember me? I applied. His, I've done some new work, here we are. And it reminds yeah. us who they are, you know? Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, that would kind of be my advice is just, again, a really clear representation of your work. A little bit like an animated show reel, you know, don't show lots if, if you don't have mm -hmm. it, just show really strong stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then be open to any opportunity, like if, for example, doing a storyboard test, maybe a studio will mm -hmm. give you an opportunity, but they might do it on a three month um, probation, you know, they might just hire, yeah. it could be a year long contract, but they'll say, oh, but we'll just do a three month thing to see how you start, you know, mm -hmm. you know, take that opportunity, still do it because um, mm. you never know. Mm. Yeah, that's, that would be my advice, I think. Yes. Um, and are you guys sto doing storyboards by hand or are you using software for that? Software, yeah. Our storyboard so, artist you... is um, Toon Boom Storyboard Pro. Yeah. Okay, so Toon Boom, Toon Boom Storyboard, that's the one we're using. Because, you know, we're running, we've got a, a storyboarding program now. We've got an MA in storyboarding oh, at Skip okay. Studio. Yeah, which is no, really it's, all, it's all tablets now, yeah, hand-drawn. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's still hand-drawn, but yeah, digital. Okay. Um, Ileana has also asked, how much work per week a storyboard artist must produce for your projects? Another good question. That's a very good question. So our storyboard artists, they are working from roughly 12-page scripts, and they're given three weeks to do a storyboard. So we will uh, we do the storyboard brief, where myself and Joe, the storyboard artist, obviously, we will take about an hour to brief the script and mm. go through. We might talk about um, key locations, key points, mm. what you know, what kind of things we need from the storyboard. So you get a brief, yeah. and then typically we'll look at thumbnails. Maybe within in the first week, where yeah. thumbnails being just you know your first preliminary sketches to plan out the board. Right, right, right. Yeah. And then we'll have another review. Uh, of the full board in the sort of the second week yeah and then the typically for our storyboard artists they spend the last week cleaning up this the, yeah. the storyboard from the roughs a little bit but yeah. they are essentially given three weeks on a on some exceptions like if it's a mm -hmm. very big episode um they'll do it in four but we mm -hmm. try to limit that because obviously you know you can't it's hard to schedule you can't schedule a random amounts of time and you know um, <laughs> no, it's we have to schedule three weeks for a board and it roll you know this the schedule is just this crazy cascading yeah, yeah flow yeah. chart you know um, yeah it's like building a house the plasterers have to start on <laughs> yeah. the bed and, and the, you better be done with the, <laughs> with, with putting that's up right. the walls <laughs> that's it, yeah. that's it. um so yeah. yeah so for us it's three weeks they get a three-week board yeah interesting for a six Good. minute for a six minute 20 show and that yeah roughly about 12 pages of script great rich well it's been a fascinating conversation um it's now yeah. uh here it's two minutes to 11 a.m there it's two minutes to midnight right uh, yeah, yes it is yeah right. <laughs> sorry we've good. kept you up very late but no, we not very, at all. That's been enjoyable. it's been we're very grateful for the opportunity to catch up it's been a pleasure catching up how long has it been long yeah. time <laughs> Yeah, long time, right? I know, it just, it just yeah. disappears, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, come well, and see us. Yeah, definitely. I, I haven't, left, I haven't been yeah. back since I left the UK in 2012. So I'm, I'm due for a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Might, might be a year or two before all this, this dust settles, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. <laughs> might be a while. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. All right. I'm going to. Um, uh, uh, Antonella, is there anything else you want to say to um, to wrap things up? Actually, I don't think Antonella's on the call anymore. So, all right. In that case, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that <was> great. <laughs> Antonella's there. Do you want to say anything yeah. else in, in no, thank you, closing guys. thought? Yeah, thank you very much for hosting this webinar. It was very, very interesting, and I think that both current students. Um, and obviously also prospects for the next intake have really enjoyed. I think it, it gave you a better overview also to the animation and also was very relevant for storyboarding um, students. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Rich. And thank Wonderful. you, Alex, as well. <laughs> no, no, my pleasure. It's been my All pleasure. Right. Thank, right. you. Lovely. thank you. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. Okay, now you get to get to bed. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thank you. Eh? No, no. Bye. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.